couple proven chest movements, i.e. bench press, um, you know, dips, uh, things of that nature. Work hard at them, progressively overload them, get to a near failure. Obviously, Kiriakos Grizzly, my lord, uh, I think that goes without say, he mogs the entire internet. I went from a 230 pound bench to a 405 pound bench in less than a year. All right, I want to kick things off talking about chest development, a journey that started with benching when you were 13, even doing bench press five times a week with your roommate and achieving an impressive result, including a 550 pound bench press, a 505 Larson press, and an absolutely elite pec bounce. Can you tell me what intermediate lifters are getting wrong about chest development in as much detail as possible? Uh, well, there's not much detail to be had. Honestly, they're not working hard enough. Uh, there's, you know, information overload. I am thankful that we have access to all the information we have today. Uh, but I am also thankful that I started lifting before that. And, you know, my whole thing was just working hard and, you know, doing a lot of work um, and, and training near to failure often um, and, you know, heavy, uh, light, uh, everything in between. Um, but, but I think people try to game the system too much. I think there's too much um, stimulus to fatigue ratio talk among beginners and intermediates. That stuff. I don't want to say it doesn't matter, but it kind of doesn't matter until you're really advanced, in my opinion. Um, but the thing is now that like social media and YouTube fitness and Instagram and everything has been around for over a decade now. Uh, we've talked about all the core stuff. So now, you know, what grabs attention is this minutia uh, that's going to hyper optimize things. But again, it's things that I don't think you need to worry about. Uh, until you know you're you're way later in the game if you're an intermediate like pick a couple proven chest movements i.e bench press um you know dips uh things of that nature work hard at them progressively overload them get to a near failure sometimes a lot of times work different rep ranges different intensity ranges and then if you, if you want to sprinkle on a little razzle dazzle at, at, the, at the top of it you know, and, and work on uh, some more specialized machines or, you know, things that are, what's the thing right now, getting that, uh, uh, the, 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 the stretch and all of this and that, like, certainly you can sprinkle that in there, but work hard at the basics for a sustained period of time. And that is going to get you 80, if not 90% of the way there. Can you maybe talk about you said kind of before YouTube fitness, maybe when you were doing, you know, benching five times a week, like you were saying, like, maybe just talk through, like, what were you doing? Did you have any structure? What were the rep ranges like, et cetera? And like, did you see strong progress during that time period? So uh, the, the progress uh, by today's standards, you know, people are going to be like, oh my gosh, that's insane. And it kind of was, but uh I'll, I'll put that up front. I went from a 230 pound bench to a 405 pound bench in less than a year. Um, we were benching five days a week. Um, there was, I guess there was a loose structure in that we would just go as heavy as we could every Monday for a one rep max. Uh, and th this was every Monday uh, for almost an entire year. Um, and then we do some back offsets that were just also heavy uh, and two failure uh, until we couldn't anymore. And then go to a, you know, maybe like a, a two plate for me and one plate for my roommate, uh, just like a, a gasser type set and go all out uh, to finish it off. And that was every Monday. Tuesday, we would intentionally go light. We would usually play the card game. If you guys ain't familiar with the card game, you take a deck of cards, you pick a weight on the bench press, um, you flip over a card, you know, if it's a face card, you do 10 reps. If it's the nine, you do nine reps, eight, eight, et cetera. Um, until you finish the whole deck of cards. Um, I generally use a plate. My, uh, roommate would use quarters, uh, at the beginning of it. Then when we got towards the end, I'd be using two plates and he'd be using a plate. Uh, but that, that was pretty much every Tuesday. We just play the card game. Um, Wednesdays we would just kind of wing it. It would usually just be heavy again. We were young. We just wanted to lift heavy. Um, Thursdays, we would intentionally do high volume. 
no specific sets or rep numbers. It was just a lot of sets above 10, um, sometimes up to 30, sometimes below, uh, but just what would now be considered junk volume uh, until we couldn't anymore. Um, and then Fridays we would kind of go heavy again. Uh, and and that, that was, we just did that. Um, we ate copious amounts of Chinese food. I think there was something to be said for that. There's lots of sodium, carbs, fats, and proteins in there. Um, we drank protein shakes before and after uh, with creatine. Uh, we didn't know anything about creatine timing or if that was a thing or any. That's just, you know, we heard protein shakes and creatine help you get big. So that's what we did. Uh, we smoked cigarettes intra workout just because we were smokers. Come to find out that nicotine may have been giving us a performance enhancement. Um, <laughs> al although the smoke in the lungs maybe was to a more of a detriment, but you know, we that's just what we did. We smoked, uh, we partied almost every night. Um, yeah. again, I was I was 22 during this time. Um, uh, we played basketball after we got done lifting. That was our leg slash cardio. We we didn't do squats or deadlifts or anything like that. Uh, and I think that kind of helped uh, with, with not fatiguing so much so that we could bench five days a week. Um, and the, the only rhyme or reason to benching five days a week, we didn't know powerlifting. We didn't know it existed. We didn't know squats and deadlifts were things. Um you know, all I ever heard people saying was, how much can you bench press? Yeah. And I wanted to have the biggest number when people said that because I have an ego. And so we bench pressed heavy every day because how else to get better at something but to do the thing? Uh, that's just, you know, basic human logic, not knowing anything about um, periodization, you know, fatigue, stimulus, resting, recovery, uh, et cetera. Do you think you could have seen uh, such great results, uh, I guess, with chest development and increasing your bench press if you were if you had a more well-rounded approach? Or do you feel the fact that you were so hyper focused on this one thing is why it moves so quickly? So it, it, it's a it's a double edged sword. Um, I probably would have still seen fairly good progress. Maybe not necessarily to that extent, but I don't think it would have been that far off if I was a little bit more balanced. Um, the, the thing about the one thing I can go back in retrospect uh, and, and see is that, uh, you know, I, I had a little bit of a base built up before we started this. Um, and then when we went and did it, the the bulk of gaining that one rep max strength came probably in like six months, you know, I, I was already into the upper mid three hundreds and then, you know, progress on the one rep max front came to a screeching halt. Um, and, and that's probably where periodization and a more balanced approach could have taken over and, and been better and certainly more sustainable. Um, I would imagine, and, and, you know, circumstances why we stopped, uh, we ended up, you know, we were young and, uh, his girlfriend got pregnant. Um, you know, me and my girlfriend decided to, to move elsewhere, him and his girlfriend and their baby moved elsewhere. And, you know, it kind of all went to shit. Uh, but, uh, you know, had I been more balanced, it would have been more sustainable. Like if we would have kept going for another two, three, four years, uh, the way we were doing it, you know, I, I was kind of starting to feel some wear and tear, uh, near the end. And I think, ultimately like us going our separate ways. And then, you know, I took some time off from lifting altogether after that. Uh, again, just because circumstance dictated it uh, was probably beneficial in the long run because uh, th that certainly wouldn't have been sustainable like long-term at all. For sure. I think we have something similar in terms of when I was in that age, like early twenties, probably not bench, but we just trained like arms every day with no <laughs> structure, with, crazy volume and we sometimes we do like game show which is like you get a weight i do 12 okay now you do 13 and we do it until no one can do it anymore just like no structure and it worked and then there was a uh, place that if you at 11 p.m uh the korean barbecue went to 9.99 for all you can eat oh so nice. we would just not eat and then at 11 we'd go to town on this korean barbecue like four or five times a night and 
didn't sleep and come home at three in the morning and right cigarette packs were like 380 at that time it was a it was a totally different world yeah yeah i think we're i think when i quit smoking they were right at four dollars a pack yeah they're they're like twenty dollars a pack now according apparently i was talking to a friend um and he's like it's twenty dollars i'm like you need to stop smoking bro yeah for real (laughs) my gosh um so I guess what I'd love to understand is knowing what you know now, let's say you had a, a client whose goal was to increase the size of their chest over the next year. How would you think about programming, rep ranges, exercise selection, range of motion, et cetera? Let's say they have a decent base, um, but they're an intermediate lifter. Like, How would you think through those variables? So just speaking in generalities, um, I would probably, you know, and they already have a decent base. I would probably look at, uh, you know, some increased range of motion movements. Um, I, I personally like a Buffalo bar, um, but dumbbells are also an option. Uh, and, you know, in terms of rep ranges, I would really have to ask this lifter, you know, and get kind of a gauge for their personality. Um, I personally think, you know, higher rep is, is a little bit more optimal, bro, uh, for hypertrophy. But at the end of the day, um, you know, kind of a a medium rep range or even a low to medium rep range can, again, will still do 90 to 95% of the job. You know, if you're trying hard enough and you're getting close enough to failure and going to failure every now and then. So it would be based on their personality as to what rep ranges I would ultimately choose because some people, they just enjoy getting after it a little bit more in the lower rep ranges, and, you know, they'll push harder as such because they enjoy that better. Um, whereas they may get bored with, you know, the higher rep range and vice versa. If there's somebody that enjoys that higher rep range a little bit more, um, they like pushing that. You know, it, it's there's a lot of communication with working with clients uh, that goes into to the decisions uh, versus where, you know, Internet discussions are so black and white on, you know, this is better than that because, you know, on paper it says this. but human beings aren't robots nor pen and paper, you know, we're human beings and emotions play a part into it. So uh, there's definitely some, some general guidelines as far as, you know, I want them being near failure. Um, I want them to do some sort of heavy compound movements um, and then some isolation movements as well. Um, and with the isolation movements, you know, where are they lagging in their upper chest or lower chest? What, what, what matters more to them? And again, what movements do they find more fun if they prefer like body weight stuffs and dips more than bench press, uh, even though I am bench press biased because that's what I know, but if they're going to work harder at dips and weighted dips and things like that, then I have no problem moving that into a more primary slot, maybe using some bench press stuff um, as a secondary movement or, you know, beyond. Uh, but yeah, just generally speaking, uh, as long as they're, they're working hard, uh, they're progressing uh, in weights in given rep ranges or multiple rep ranges, uh, and they're not sacrificing their forms when doing so. So if we're doing a full range of motion buffalo bar bench press, uh, I don't want them, and and they're they're I want them to use a little bit of an arch uh, to keep themselves safe, and, but I don't want them to to change their arch like when the weight gets heavier, like oh let me arch you know an inch higher. Uh, so I can move this weight. Uh, no, you need to progressively overload the same range that you're doing, uh, and, and even the same tempo. And I, I think that's somewhere I also, when, when working towards hypertrophy, uh, emphasize the eccentrics and not necessarily in the sense that the eccentric is going to be better for hypertrophy, uh, just in and of itself. But that if you're controlling the tempo of those eccentrics, uh, you're, you're more consistent with your, your reps, uh, comparing set to set, uh, comparing ranges of motion and staying constantly, you know, in, in the same range of motion, uh, and same bar path, et cetera. So when you are progressively overloading and you're adding weights, uh, it, it kind of self polices itself for lack of a better term um, in, in keeping the lifter consistent and not trying to game the system just for the sake of adding weight and or reps uh, to a given weight. Okay. And 
something I notice, I guess, with bench press specifically is that a lot of intermediates kind of plateau at some point and they don't know what to do. I'm curious if you just have any thoughts or, or tidbits regarding uh, bench press plateaus. It's like with anything, you have to change variables. You have to look at what you're doing. Um, and, you know, if you've reached a plateau doing whatever it is that you're doing, you have to do something else. Um, now, you, you need to look at your volume. You need to look at your intensity. Um, when is the last time that you took a break uh, from bench pressing? Um, you know, maybe you were just that far overworked into the same, uh, you know, pattern of motion uh, that you need to resensitize a little bit. Uh, when's the last time you trained certain variations? What variations were they? How hard did you push them? Um, oftentimes, you take a break from bench press and just just focus exclusively on close grip bench press. When your close grip bench press catches and or passes your regular bench press, within short order, your regular bench press is going to go above and beyond that. Um, and, and generally, you know assuming volume and intensity were all progressed in a pretty smart manner. Uh, it, it's, you know, where you need to look at the variations, you know, where, what's your quote unquote weakness off the bench. And generally speaking there, it's just, you're not strong enough. A lot of people like the point of little individual things, but it, it all adds up. And, uh, you know, I, I think if you've been going hard for a long time, you can certainly take a break from the movement altogether. Um, it, but most times probably just find a new variation or something that you haven't done in a while that you know is good for you. Um, and, and a lot of times it's close grip bench press. Uh, or if, if you haven't been training pause bench presses, you know, train pauses for a while if you've only been doing touch and go. Um, if you've only been doing pause bench presses, do some touch and go bench presses. I know people will, you know, not think a power lifter would suggest that. Um, but you'll, you'll get – you know, more reps with more weight doing touch and go versus pausing everything. And even if that's not doing anything mechanically, uh, I have a hunch that it is, but even if you were to throw that part out, just the confidence uh, building and seeing yourself hitting these higher weights and or more volume is going to translate when you go back to pausing. Yeah, I feel like there's a big mental component when you hit a plateau as well. So just making a shift, whether it's a different exercise or a different rep range or a different tempo, it's just giving you something to progress on again. And yes. it's exciting, right? Like you don't want to lose that excitement when you're training. You don't want to go in dreading being like, I'm stuck at this lift and I'm just trying to like push through this lift forever and I keep getting stuck. It's better to just get something fresh, build up on that, get some confidence there, and then move back when ready. Like, I feel like that's one of those, like, adjustments that you have to, like, not lie to yourself and be aware of, like, hey, I'm really, like, mentally not doing great on this lift right now. Like, forget the physical part, but, like, I need to get that momentum and excitement back. Absolutely. And, and it's a case where, you know, you, you're going to take one step back, uh, you know, to take two steps forward. Um, and I, I apply that same logic, like when I, I cut weight, um, you know, even before like this big cut that I did, um, I, I would cut from 300 down to the, you know, 270s quite often uh, and hang out there. But when, when I would be in that cut, I would look to um, movements or variations that I'd either never done before or hadn't done in a long time. Uh, so I could still progress at something while cutting when I knew, you know, my my big three were going to suffer. That's just part of it when you get advanced and, you know, you're cutting 20, 30 pounds. Even if it's temporary, those lifts are going to suffer. So I, I would go to variations uh, because I do thrive on, you know, PRs and progression and thing like that. Uh, and, and that would help, you know, the, the mental aspect a lot uh, when cutting weight. And, and, and it's very much the same when you hit a plateau on a specific lift. You can apply that same principle uh, to, to, you know, put that lift aside momentarily. Um, and then when you come back, you know, nine times out of 10, you're just going to absolutely crush it. Awesome. So uh, tell me, what is your Mount Rushmore, your four favorite exercises for chest development? Um, Larson press, bench press, um, I, 
I like dips. My shoulders don't like dips. Um, and then I like a uh, incline log press. It, it's not as chesty, but you still get some chest there. But I, it's just it's so fun. I've got to throw that in there. And and I I'm not going to tell anybody that like that needs to be a staple in your you know chest development programming because it absolutely doesn't. That's just something that I find very, very, very fun. And it kind of hits your upper chest too. So we'll, we'll nice. throw that one in there. Awesome. So I know Alex uh, Leonidas says his pecs improved because of the Larson press. Um, can you maybe talk through that exercise and why you think it's a solid choice? That Because it's, it's a lift that I think most people don't do. So, and and my... My goals with Larson Press never had anything to do with chest development. Um, that just ended up being a byproduct of it. Uh, but, you know, you, you are taking your lower body uh, out of it. And, um, you know, th these these compound movements, especially bench press, you know, Larson Press, things like that, uh, you just get so much overload. And they're so fun. Uh, and you can see the progressions you know, a lot of machines and you can progress on the machines. Don't get me wrong. And they might be better in isolation. Um, and you might get a better stretch and this and that, but just, just the, the raw brutality of it isn't there. And that, that zest to want to work hard and improve at it isn't quite the same as when you're doing a Larson press. So uh, the, the main benefit in terms of chest development though, for Larson press over say a traditional bench press you know, when, when you raise your feet up off the ground and you kind of flatten yourself out a little bit more, and I still do it with an arch. I set up my arch first. Uh, but e even that said, you know, it, it's a little bit less pronounced than my full competition bench setup. So you're getting a little bit more range of motion. You're getting a little bit more stretch. Um, but it, other than that, it's virtually identical to the bench press. Um, just with the added range of motion, the added stretch. Uh, you're going to take a little hit in performance in terms of weight on the bar from your bench press, but it's really not as much as most people think, assuming you have a, a good competition bench. If you're on a commercial bench pad that's really narrow, it gets a little sketchy. Um, so, you know, just keep that in mind. But if, if you go to a gym with, you know, a powerlifting gym or a gym that has like powerlifting spec bench presses, um, it's really you don't lose that much stability generally speaking, it's a five to 10% at most, uh, off of your bench press. Um, but, but it, it, it isolates that upper body a little bit more. So your lower body isn't assisting very much at all. Um, and it, it's pretty much all, you know, pecs, a little bit of shoulders and then triceps. Awesome. That's great. And I want to, uh, move back. You said that you like dips, but it bothers your shoulder. For me, I do weighted dips as my main movement because it doesn't bother my shoulder and bench bothers my shoulder. So I was benching for years and no matter kind of like what angle, what variation, I'd still get this shoulder discomfort. And then I kind of switched the dips and I'm like, this feels good. So um, I've just kind of made that my main uh, chest mover, like my primary yeah, and there's a lot to be said for that. Things just feeling good uh, versus something else. You know, people will be, again, on paper, people will say either, oh, bench is better than dips because this, or people will say dips are better than bench because that. Uh, but your human reality and me, you know, my shoulders don't like dips as much, so I don't really do dips. Yours don't like bench press, so you don't do bench press. And it's that simple most times. For sure. All right. So now what I want to do is I want to throw out some topics and you tell me if they're overrated, underrated, or fairly rated. Okay. All right. The first one is uh, intermittent fasting. I love intermittent fasting. Um, I'm going to say when, when discussed properly is fairly rated. It, it's not the zealots of anything will overrate things. Uh, but, but just on paper for what it is, uh, I think it's fairly rated. Um, it's something I've relied on many, many times, not only to cut weight, I've used it to control bulks. I, my appetite is absolutely insane. Um, so I, I've, I've used it even in a bulk and done very well with it. Uh, gosh, I've been doing intermittent fasting, uh, on and off sometimes for a year, two years at a time. Um, I've done 24, 48, 72 hour fasts, uh, Crazy. routinely, um, 
I think it's fairly rated if you're using it as a tool to control calories. Okay. For any of the magical, super, <laughs> you know, out there stuff, it, it's overrated in that case. That's it increases you know. your testosterone by 7,000%. Yeah. Oh, your human growth hormone naturally gets, you know, spiked if you fast. And, you know, even if it does, it is so temporary that it doesn't matter. And if you're fasting for 72 hours, I don't care if your growth hormone is spiking. You're not giving yourself nothing to grow with. Um, so it's, yeah, but yeah, people, it can be overrated when discussed in that manner, but if you're using it just as a tool to control calories and it fits your lifestyle, um, and, and you're somebody who does have a larger appetite, um, I think it can be crucial for dietary adherence. Um, so I'm going to say fairly rated. All right. Next one here. Uh, pumpkin spice lattes. Underrated. Uh, I don't know if the camera is going to pick this up. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, and I, I have a custom pumpkin spice latte weight belt. Um, so yeah, I, I love, I've, I've been a pumpkin slut since like 20, I think 2015 was the first time I tried it. Um, and I live stream every year on Facebook for pumpkin spice latte opening day at Starbucks. Um, I, man, I love pumpkin spice lattes. I don't know what took me so long to try them. I don't know what compelled me to try it when I first did, but uh, yeah, they, they they make me happy. <laughs> I think they. I think Starbucks has this like pumpkin spice loaf thing too. It's really good. I, I, I was like, I tried it. I was like, this is really good. Like everything pumpkin spice is good. I'm a black it, coffee drinker, but like it's it's tasty. I, I'm I'm actually you know my my mug says pumpkin spice but I, I'm drinking black coffee right now. <laughs> uh, they they're so calorically dense. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a dessert. It, it is a dessert. But for inquiring minds, a venti pumpkin spice latte from Starbucks contains 18 grams of protein. So do with that what you will. It's a protein shake. That there you go. It's a protein shake. <laughs> Okay, I got one more here. Overrated or underrated? Conditioning and cardio. Underrated. Super underrated. Uh, especially for strength athletes. They are very underdeveloped in this area, I find. Um, every client that I intake does a conditioning block for the first four weeks. That is non-negotiable. Um, just so I know that they'll be in the shape I need them in for my programming. Um, and I think this is something... It, it's starting to come around. Uh, I noticed it, you know, back in like 2016, 2017, starting to make some smaller waves. It seems to be making bigger waves now. Um, but I, you know, from 2015 to 2017, the only thing I changed in my training was adding cardio and uh, limiting my rest sets, you know, on certain blocks uh, of training to help with my conditioning um, you know, I went from a 1,775 pound total at 288 to a 1,950 pound total at 304. Um, and even that, like I was capable of more, I dropped a deadlift I shouldn't have dropped. Um, and not only was I, you know, almost 20 pounds heavier, uh, I got more holes in my belt. So I was a little bit leaner, not that I was lean, but I was leaner than I was at 288 when I was over 300 pounds. Um, and, and Cardio and conditioning was the only thing I added to my training. So not only did I get bigger and leaner, I got stronger. Um, and it's easy to look at powerlifting on paper and say, well, it's just nine lifts, you know, in a competition. And on paper, that's what it is. Uh, however, when you're at a meet, um, there are nerves at play. You know, there's the warm up room. Um, you got to warm up to those three lifts. And then the, the main thing with the nerves and the adrenaline is your heart rate spiking. Um, and then it's going to come back down and then it's going to spike again. And this is going to happen through the course of a five to 15 hour day, depending upon the size of the meat. And so while you wouldn't think cardio is necessary just to do nine lifts, um, when, when you consider how often your heart is going to be elevated during that day, even when it's not your turn to lift, uh, you'll, you'll get adrenaline rushes and dumps sometimes uh, feeding off the energy of the crowd that's there or just getting in your own head. So having that ability to recover from an elevated heart rate multiple times 
uh, certainly plays a part, you know, in competition, even though it's only nine single lifts. Uh, scaling that back down to, let's just say, a gin pop lifter. Um, That's what I'm saying. What if you're more someone who cares about aesthetics and bodybuilding? Like, I feel like it's still maybe underrated. I, it's still underrated because you're you're going to be able to recover better on, on your sets, on your working sets. Um, you'll be able to recover quicker. You'll maybe be able to get more work in because you can recover better. So you can increase your overall volume. You can take more sets closer to failure, recover from them better. Um, I, it does burn more calories when you do some cardio, uh, than if you didn't do cardio at all. But I, I don't like to look at it that way because then it's really easy to start splitting hairs and be like, Oh, I did 300 calories worth of cardio. So I can add 300 calories to my diet. And you think you're adding 300 calories to your diet, but then, you know, you also had a spoon of peanut butter when you were making your son's sandwich too, because all oh, I did my cardio today and, uh, you know, a couple little things and you'll, you'll eat back, you know, double the calories that you burn during cardio. Um, but, but just, you know, and, and then just being healthy, like generally in life, uh, having some sort of base of cardio, um, is, you know, supremely important, um, you know, running around chasing kids, taking them to whatever practices, ball games, yeah. being able to jump in and play with them, uh, you know, all of these things. It, it's just, I think it's, it's necessary. Not only do I think it's underrated, uh, I think it should be, you know, required for pretty much everybody, regardless of what your goals are. Yeah, I feel like there's a baseline that we should all be trying to hit regardless of what our goals are. And I think yes. you can go on the extreme side of things, which I'm not on the longevity, which is like, you're always testing your VO2 max and you're yeah. monitoring your sleep. And I think to me, that's not the right space, but it's like, I just make sure I do like some high intensity cardio that I enjoy a couple times a week. Right. And that keeps me at a good baseline. And, um, yeah. Like, and, and, you know, when, once you build that base, it is extremely easy to maintain it. Like you do not have to kill yourself uh, you know, on the treadmill or elliptical or whatever, um, you know, five times a week to maintain your cardio, you, you can build a solid base and then, you know, go shoot some hoops with your friends or go toss a football and, you know, run some routes here and there, or even, uh, you know, I like fartlek style training, um, going on walks on trails and, you know, jogging for a couple minutes at a time, walking for a minute or two, maybe I'm going to sprint for, five seconds, you know, here and there, and then walk for another five minutes, things like that. It's really, really easy to maintain that base. Yeah. Every time I think my cardio is good, I, uh, I'll play basketball with like a group of like 20 year olds. <laughs> and then, and then I'll realize how bad my cardio is. It's right. like, cause they can, they can go for hours. And if I'm going hard for, I don't know, let's say 15, 20 minutes on the court, like I'm pretty, I'm pretty gassed playing right. still even with like having a decent baseline of cardio because they can just go like a hundred percent the whole time. Yeah, exactly. And that's, you know, that's what we did, you know, as 20 year olds and, you know, we even, you know, smoke cigarettes and stuff and it didn't matter. We could just go run and run and run. And I'm in the same boat now. Like if I were to play actual full court basketball, you know, after a game or two, I'm, I'm hoping either my team loses and we get off or I'm telling somebody, Hey, come take my spot. Like I got to go get my kid or something like that. Make up some <laughs> excuse to, to leave. For sure. All right. So now what I'm going to do is I'll throw out some quotes you've said in the past. Oh, gosh. Uh, tell me your first take on it. Okay. The first one is uh, when I lost the weight, the attention from normal people was tenfold. It almost offended me to a degree because the fat guy was a thousand times more obsessed about training and numbers and eating all the time. Yes. And, and it, that feeling is still there um, because I busted my ass. And I was extremely dedicated to powerlifting uh, for probably three to four years. I, I I put it ahead of my family for a little bit. Um, not very happy to say that, but I did. Um, and even though I was quote unquote fat, uh, I was more meticulous with what I was eating uh, th than I am even when I was cutting weight or now, you know, having kept the weight off for a couple of years. Um and I was more meticulous with my meal timing. I was more meticulous with my training. Uh, but nobody cares. <laughs> Powerlifting is such a niche sport and niche circle. Um, you know, lifting as a hobby in general, uh, there's such a small percentage of us who do it. 
So, and then you take something even more specialized like powerlifting or strongman, and and then you take that percentage even lower. And, you know, while within our space, the numbers that I put up, like people can recognize and be like, oh man, you know, that's really, really strong. Um, When you're just out in the real world, you know, you're not, you're not wearing that 775 pound squat. You're not wearing that 550 pound bench press, especially here where I'm at. You're just another fat dude in Walmart. You know, maybe, maybe you're, you're a little, not as soft as some of the other, you know, regular couch potatoes in Walmart, but you're just another guy in East Tennessee. Um, but then, you know, when I lost the weight and, you know, your, your, your muscles are a little bit more defined, you look bigger, um, flash a little bit of abs when you're changing your clothes, take your shirt off. And then it was, Oh my God, what's your secret? And this and that. And it's like, you know, I restricted my calories and that was hard mentally and, you know, required discipline, but that, that's all I did. I just restricted my calories. Like everything else I was extremely loose with, as far as what time I ate or what I was doing training wise, I didn't have set numbers that I needed to hit that I was extremely anal about or nothing like that. And yeah, to get more attention um, for being not as dedicated uh, definitely stings a little bit, but also puts things into perspective, uh, you know, as you know, the real world versus the little bubbles uh, we we kind of get in, in the, the social media space. Yeah, I'm confident you've never been in a uh, real life scenario with the Gen Pop, and they're like, "What's your Larson press, bro?" But I'm sure that's never happened. Nobody has <laughs> ever asked me my Larson press in real life. I, I've got a couple, you know. Oh, you're kind of big. Look at how much you bench press, which is pretty common. But yeah, no, nobody's asked my Larson press or my front squat or anything like super niche outside of bench press. All right, next one here. Disagreement is good when it's not just for clicks. This is what leads to search, growth, and either solidifying your own position or opening your eyes to a new one. Yes. So, you know, oftentimes in our space, especially when there's a hot topic, uh, you know, people rush and clamor to get a video out or get a post out and strike while the iron's hot. And a lot of times you'll see people throwing logic and reason out the window and you know when when it is this hot topic and most people are in agreement and it's quite obvious that they're in agreement for you know obvious reasons and then somebody's got to make the well actually um post just and and it's just for that just to disagree for no other reason to rage bait or click bait or whatever the case may be and it's a thing unfortunately Um, and and it does get the attention they're looking for. Um, but if you're actually looking to genuinely learn something, uh, it is okay to disagree on things and not see eye to eye. Uh, but presenting, you know, evidence as to why you disagree while also being opening open to listening to the evidence, uh, or experiences from the other side as to why, you know, they see it the way they do. Um, and genuinely listening to all sides and, and then taking all of that into account and seeing where you end up that way or, you know, oftentimes you end up somewhere in the middle. Um, you know, the Internet discussions tend to be black and white, but most of us are in that gray area. We may lean one side or the other, um, but, but if you can look at it with an open mind, uh, you don't always have to agree with everybody. You don't have to agree with, you know, your idols or your favorite influencer or your friends or your parents, whoever it may be. But as long as you're open to to hearing the what's and why's uh, and and not just disagreeing to be a dick and get clicks, uh, I think disagreement uh, is productive. Agreed. And I feel like the people whose content I end up watching the most are the ones where I can't always predict exactly what the video is going to be. Cause there's, uh, some times where I'll watch like either a reaction video or like that type of video and I can predict what the person's going to say and they say it to a T and I'm like, I'm not going to gain value from this because I've already been able to kind of figure out what their position is going to be based on, uh, their behavior and, and values and views. So it's it's more exciting when I think someone's going to say something and they say something else, because to me, a lot of that time, they're 
actually trying to be intellectually honest on the topic. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's refreshing. And, you know, a lot of people are playing the game and, you know, they have an audience that sees things one way and they're just going to spoon feed their audience that so they can keep them and, you know, keep them happy and clicking and viewing and buying merch and whatever the case may be. Um, and I, I think, now don't get me wrong, some of those people blow up and get extremely huge, but oftentimes uh, you'll see those sort of creators trying to blossom, you know, at our lower levels and they'll, they'll burn out in a hurry uh, because it, most of the time it's not sustainable just to, to feed an audience what you think they want versus who you actually are or what you actually feel. Either you're going to burn out yourself or they're going to see that it's just a facade and, you know, stop playing along with you. For sure. I got one more here. I prefer one to two meals. I'm still going to be hungry, but there's at least one portion of the day where I'm happy. My adherence only happens this way. Intermittent fasting. That's, you know, that, that's why I liked it because I, I could, you know, I've, I've gone down the route of, well, this, this bodybuilder style of eating is, you know, more optimal and, you know, more protein synthesis throughout the day, eating the five to six small meals, uh, you know, with protein and carbs in, in each meal and blah, blah, blah. And it may be, I, I would even say that it is more optimal, but when we're talking more optimal, like what pairs are we splitting? Um, especially for natural lifters, uh, you know, it, it, are you getting a half a percent edge that way, a 1% edge that way, a 2% edge, is that edge worth it to you? Um, when, when I'm eating that way, I'm going to be hungry all day. Even though I'm eating five or six times a day, it's not going to satisfy me. It's not going to cure that itch. I'm going to be hungry the entire time, miserable the entire time, and I'm probably not going to stick to it for very long. Uh, with with the, the one to two meals, um, and, and I'm not as rigid with that anymore, but um, with the one to two meals, generally speaking, the first meal would be like pre-workout when I was working out in the afternoons. Uh, I would eat. Uh, a smaller meal pre-workout, usually somewhere between 400 and 800 to 1,000 calories, depending, and then save my biggest meal for post-workout and before bedtime. And it would be, you know, 1,000 to 2,000 calories in one sitting. If, if I did have some hankering for a sweet tooth or fast food, it was very easy to fit that in the mix. More often than not, you know, because I do have an appetite, it was still a very clean meal um, with with a high volume of food. And even though I was in a caloric deficit, uh, I was going to bed, you know, feeling fat and happy because I just ate 1,500 to 2,000 calories worth of food, oftentimes very high volume, lower calorie food, you know, and high protein. Um, and it was just so much easier for me to stay on track that way. Uh, whereas with the, the small meals all day, again, I would be hungry the whole time, going to bed hungry. And that that those nighttime pre-bed snacks, you know, were the hardest. So if I could have my biggest meal and save my calories for last, uh, that made adherence a whole lot easier for me. Yeah, and I have a similar experience. So I train at like 930 in the morning, 930 to 11. So I eat kind of first thing when I wake up, like, that way I have some more energy at the gym. But then at around 12 or 1, I have like a really big meal. Um, so like half of it's clean or it's like chicken, rice, and broccoli. But then I also have like a giant bowl of ramen or I'll have like chicken nuggets and maybe have a whole box of strawberries. Like I'm just having this giant meal and then I don't really eat from like 1 to 8 or 9 p.m. So at that time, I'm just kind of like working in my office. I'll drink coffee and stuff, but I'm like decently full. Right. And then I have a big dinner and then I'll usually finish the night with like a bag of popcorn or something like that. That way it's something salty, but it's also like decent on the volume side of things and has some fiber. Right. And uh, that works better than when I'm trying to, when I have a smaller post uh, workout meal. Cause then I find myself in the kitchen at like three or 4 PM wanting to eat something right. grazing or I'll make something, but it's not satisfying. And then I'm just consistently thinking about food. So having that kind of giant lunch for me at least makes it so then 
for like six, seven hours, I'm not like, I'm not food focused. Right. And I, I think that's the biggest key for most people is you, you got to find what works for you um, rather than what is optimal, unless you're making a living of being a bodybuilder or fitness influencer or something of that nature. Um, you know, optimal is you're not, you're probably not going to stick to it. There's, there's those rare exceptions that just have this superhuman willpower and we'll be able to do everything completely optimal. But for, for 99.9% .9 of us, it, it's, you know, finding our preferences and what works best for us and, and, you know, being consistent uh, over time. And, and if you're giving up one to 2% of being super hyper optimal, uh, you know, it, it's, it's fine. It's not that big a deal for, for cutting, uh, for most people, I tell them the most important thing is figuring out a diet structure that works for you. Yes. And being fairly consistent when you can, where it's right. like, I eat at this time of day, I eat these types of food in this calorie range, and it's kind of on autopilot. And then maybe you have a slightly different structure on weekends if you're more social, et cetera. But rather than focusing on like, is strawberries better than blueberries? Or right. <laughs> is chicken better than tilapia? It's more like, what times of the day are you eating? How full do you need to be? What are the calories looking at? If you're fitting in more fun foods, typically what's the right time of day for you to do that? And then just working off that. And it's not Absolutely. sexy, but I feel like people who, um, let's say they, they lose fat and they maintain it for a long period of time. I think they have a pretty, they might not eat the exact same foods, but they have a fairly consistent diet structure. It's not one day, seven meals, the next day's two meals it's usually kind of the same. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, you know, how I am now is I'm, I'm very consistent with my patterns, with what types of foods I'm eating. Um, I, I'm a little bit more loose uh, now that, you know, I've found my rhythm and stuff and I weigh myself every day. And if, if I catch myself getting, you know, a, a little heavier than I want to be for three days in a row, it's like, okay, maybe, you know, Clean it up. tighten down the range just a little bit and, if, if it goes too far the opposite way, it's like, oh, well, I can be a little bit more relaxed. And I've, I've kind of, you know, when I ended my cut, I was in the, you know, between 210 and 215. Uh, I held that for about six months. And, you know, it's really, I was having to not eat <laughs> a lot to stay in that range. And uh, I, I wasn't really happy with that. Uh, and then, you know, I, I put back on another 10 pounds and I've been, you know, I'll weigh, over the last two years now between 223 and 232 uh, on a given day. And, and like I said, when, when I get up in those lower 230s, I'll pull back a little bit. When I get in the lower 220s, I'll relax a little bit, just been kind of hovering around there. And of course, you know, next week I've got to weigh in for a competition. So I'll, I'll have to be 220, you know, on that day uh, of weigh-ins. Um, but, but otherwise been a loose structure eating the same foods, give or take, uh, for the last two years. Nice. All right. Now I'm going to talk about the most important thing for the day. I'm going to pull a picture on the screen here and I want to talk about the, the mogging videos. So can you tell the backstory of them and then tell me something that went better than expected and something that went worse than expected during the, the mogging saga? Um, uh, you know, it's something I've, I've, always been really strong um and i've always had good lifts and you know that that was always my focus of training especially in my powerlifting days and you know i wanted something the the lifts themselves now kind of don't stand out as much as they used to when i first started uploading like if somebody bench pressed 500 pounds like the world would stop and watch it and it, it's funny to say now that even though it's not a common thing with how much social media has grown, you know, you can see a 500 bit pound bench press any day of the week when you click on Instagram or something. Um, but I wanted to bring sort of a fun twist to it uh, and, and have fun with uh, sort of the rise of the, the Noble Natty crew uh, were, were most of my victims. Uh, <laughs> and it was all tongue in cheek, but, and, and, and it was in an effort to, to help grow my channel and things like that and have fun. And, uh, it was a lot of fun and I did reach a lot of new subscribers and I had fun with the creators and, you know, all aside from uh, like Doucette and Jeff Cavalier um, 
and I think Kino Body. I did one for him too. Uh, those three aside, like everybody else, uh, I have at least some sort of a personal relationship with. Um, and, you know, they they had fun with it. It was all in, in, in good fun. Uh, I actually, Coach Greg made a video on me. It wasn't about my mogging video per se, but, you know, he made a video. It was something, it, it was him whining about um, uh, Canada's, stock of testosterone running low or something and they were going to run out of his prescribed trt and in in the background is his supplements and his test boosters so i i you know i pointed out like hey bro if your test boosters were doing what they said they did why couldn't you just use those you know and they don't that was the whole point he ended up making a video out of me and, and he he pulled up my mogging video of him uh because i think i showed myself like bitch pressing more than him uh, more than his world record, you know, weight classes aside, of course. Uh, but he would have had to have had that video saved, which I know him and editor Steve, I swear, whoever else is on his team, like if you sneeze and accidentally say Greg on the internet, like they've got that video in their queue, just waiting just in case they need it one day. Uh, so that, that would be unexpected was, uh, Greg making a video about me and, and pulling up my mogging video of him. Um, and, and of course, you know, his whole crowd was either fake weights or I'm lying about being drug free and this and that. So I think that would be the most unexpected thing, uh, that came from it. As far as I didn't really have any expectations with it other than to have fun with some of my friends on here and, and make light of things while also, um, you know, trying to expose to a new audience, you know, like how strong I was and what I bring to the table. And I, I genuinely like with, with the, the creators that I had featured, uh, most of us probably even talk more now than we did before I did those videos. So it, it was really cool to, you know, get with some of those guys and, uh, you know, bounce some ideas off them. And I, I've had some of them in, you know, some interview videos with me and, uh, or, you know, some predictions like last year when I did my big CrossFit wad for my birthday, I had some of them join me on that video for predictions and things like that. So it, it really, as far as the, the community building aspect of it, um, was probably the best part. Awesome. And, and that's me on the right waiting for more mogging videos. <laughs> I'm not going to get them. That's me. I'm Wolverine. There. <laughs> But I, do I did officially retire the series. Uh, my last one was uh, with uh, Paris, uh, Bald Omni Man, and Alex Leonidas. Uh, I don't know if you were around uh, back watching circa 2016, 2017. Alex and I didn't see eye to eye back then. And I made a lot of videos that were not very nice <laughs> about Alex uh, with ill intent. Not that some of the stuff that I said was wrong because a lot of what I said was right. Um, but just the way I delivered it and with the intent I delivered it. So, uh, you know, obviously him and I have reconciled and I've spoke to him. I've been on his channel. Yeah. You're on his channel. I saw that. Yeah. But, uh, I, I intentionally saved him, uh, and Paris for the last video. Paris, Paris reignited my, my passion for, the, the community, um, awesome. seeing his rise, uh, you know, going from just being in everybody's comment section for like six months straight. I swear, as soon as a video would upload, there was a bald Omni man comment on it. Um, but you know, me, me and him, have, I speak to him almost every day. Um, but seeing his rise really kind of re sparked my love for the community. Um, so, so him on that end, and then Alex on the other end, like us you know, being almost like the antithesis of each other, you know, coming back around at the end of the day uh, and, and coming back together. So it, it was symbolic having both of those in, you know, my last mogging video. Perhaps, you know, there will be some mog videos in the future, but I definitely wanted to end that first run with those two uh, as my final victims. That's awesome. So now what I'm going to force you to do here is I'm going to throw some people on the screen and tell me if you would mog them or they would mog you. Oh gosh. Let me know when you can see them. We got Okay, uh, so all okay, right. Go ahead. We'll start with Miss Frizzle because this one's personal to me. Um I I have a kid. We watch Magic School Bus a lot. 
You can call that 405 on that bench, or you can call it, you know, 485, whatever the kilo conversion is, if those are 25 kilo plates. Yeah. In that episode, that is the gravity episode. She was not on Earth. She had gravity turned way down, and she did not even do a rep with that weight. She simply unracked that and re-racked it. She didn't even do a rep. So everybody's saying, oh, Miss Frizzle benching four plate. Nope, she never benched it. Not, not <laughs> only... Not only was gravity turned all the way down, but she didn't even do a complete rep. So she is Brad Castleberry with extra steps. So wow. let's, get, let's get Frizzle out of the way. Um, next is Bukes. Uh, my man, Eric Bugenhagen. Uh, me and him also have some history. Uh, shout out to him for doing my deadlift competition during COVID. Uh, we also had some beef adjacent it wasn't full on beef but beef adjacent back in that 2016-2017 era um obviously these days he would mug me um back then i think i got the better of him uh i'm gonna call that one a wash uh but but today certainly he would mug me uh Shout out to everybody who remembers the egg video. If y'all remember the egg video, it's now privated on my channel, but I went after Mr. Is, is, the, is the egg video when he guzzled a dozen raw eggs or is it something totally different? He guzzled a dozen raw eggs and I made a comment in that video and then he made some remarks uh, allegedly about me in his next video and I made a video response to that video. And that, that video response is the egg video. And I did mock him in that video. Um, but, you know, I, so that this, I, I will tell this little part of the story. Um, you know, he ended up being in the WWE. Yeah. Well, he ended up messaging me not long after I made that egg video. And, uh, this was before anybody knew he was going to the WWE. He messaged me on Instagram and said, Hey man, you know, I'm sorry to ask you to do this, but can you take down that video? Because it has me cursing in it. And that, that's, that's when he initially wiped his channel of all his old videos. Um, and, and he told me, so I, I knew exclusively before most everybody that he was going to the WWE. I obviously didn't say nothing because that was his business. Um, but, but I did private that video and, it was one of my better performing videos, but I'm not going to, you know, jeopardize a man's livelihood over some silly YouTube drama. No. So, you know, I, I gladly obliged and took down the video um, and it's it's remained private since. But it, it comes up in, in the lore sometimes when I'm doing my live streams. Uh, people say release the egg video, release the egg video. Um, and I've, I've made a promise to my channel members when I hit a certain number of channel members that they will see it first uh, and maybe we'll revive that video again. Um, but yeah, got off track there for a little bit. Okay. So that leaves uh, Sam Sheether. He will absolutely mock me. And he is the one person that I will concede in this space that I've seen so far. There's certainly other people out there. He is the one person that I will concede that if getting good at lifting was just a matter of ramming your head through a brick wall over and over and over and working hard. He's the one person I will concede that could outwork me. Um, there may be other people who could, don't get me wrong. They would have to prove it. He's the one who I will say beyond a shadow of a doubt, if, if that's all it took was sheer hard work, he would do it. So he'll mog me. And then obviously Kiriakos Grizzly, my Lord, uh, I think that goes without say, he mogs the entire internet. So uh, I am that, uh, you know, all hail our bloat Lord commander in chief. Um, yeah. He, he would certainly mog me. That's hilarious. Um, so I think one thing, kind of the mogging videos, and I've seen a lot of other videos you've done, like you had this ridiculous interview where you pretended to interview Matt does fitness. <laughs> you've done, you did like really bad Kung Fu movie impressions. Like they're just some, really out there videos and i'm curious why is having a sense of humor important in a world where everyone takes themselves so seriously you dug really deep i am impressed that you uh brought those to light uh in this interview <laughs> so uh <laughs> gosh uh so the the map video matt does fitness which he is absolutely huge now um but 
he this was back probably like 2013 2014 you know commented on one of my videos like hey you want to sub for sub and this was back when sub for subbing was a thing and uh you know i was we were subscribed to each other when we both had less than a thousand subscribers um obviously he's got way more than that now uh but uh yeah i i just you know back then i thought it would be funny to uh make a a, a tongue-in-cheek interview with him and you know make it preposterous and it is very poorly edited and i think that looking back today kind of adds to the character of it um very dry in humor uh but it, it was fun to make gosh the old kung fu when i thought i made that one private i need to go back and uh, <laughs> uh, check what else i have uploaded on the internet but uh, I, yeah, I downloaded it and sent it to greg Doucette, so he had it. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome uh no, it, it's, you know, like, I started YouTubing before, you know, people were getting on here exclusively to make it a career path. Um, and, and I think now most people starting a channel, that's what their ultimate goal is, is to, you know, blow up and make money and make it a, a, a sort of career path. Uh, I started uploading for fun. I still upload for fun. Um, I do make some money with coaching and stuff that stems directly from my YouTube uh, ad revenue is next to non-existent, but you know, there's still some there, but, uh, my motivations and intentions with uploads aren't monetarily related. Um, and, and so I, I can't upload wacky stuff and, you know, sometimes you throw shit at a wall and sometimes it sticks, sometimes it doesn't. And that's okay. Uh, I am very confident in myself. Uh, I think that's something that comes with, you know, age and life experience, uh, as well as, you know, some of us are just have a natural confidence and some of it's learned. A lot of it's been learned for me. Uh, and, and, you know, people are going to say what they're going to say. I grew up before the internet and before social media. So I, I, I can take it with a grain of salt, uh, when, you know, some random screen name with no profile picture, tells me I'm stupid or dumb or whatever the case for uploading, whatever it may be. There's always going to be those people out there um, has zero effect on my life. So, you know, I, I'm just, I'm glad to be in a position where I'm at now. Um, I am, I wouldn't be opposed to YouTube being a more significant source of revenue for me, uh, but it, it's not the goals. And as such, you know, even if it was the goals, I'm, I'm still secure enough outside of it that I, I really don't think I would let it affect, you know, what I want to upload or not upload. And I'm glad like fitness isn't, you know, in my username or anything like that. Uh, because if I, I, I do upload something outside and, and sometimes people say, well, this isn't lifting related or it's not fitness related. Well, neither is my username. Um, so I just upload what I want to upload and I'm going to upload what I want to upload regardless. I don't, I don't think it's just about uploading. I think it's a personality thing. Like, I feel like you're probably just naturally a funny person and you joke around. You know what I mean? Like that is my guess, right? Yeah. 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 Content, yeah. Right? I, I and I think a lot of people, they think that they need to take themselves like really seriously and they can't joke around because they're serious. Like, and I feel like that's a missed opportunity to just like laugh and live life and stuff like that. I agree. And and there's certainly been times in my life where I did take, you know, I, I took powerlifting too serious. Like I said, I, I put it ahead of my family for a little bit. And uh, it's because I was trying to get as good as, as I could and I wanted to be the best. And it was short lived. Thankfully, um, my soon to be ex-wife uh, were getting divorced for non-powerlifting reasons. But, uh, you know, back then an ultimatum was given and, and I needed to hear that ultimatum uh, or I probably would have kept going. Um, but yeah, and, and life got better after that, you know, our issues aside, uh, there's, you can be serious and focused on goals and be driven without taking yourself too seriously. And, and I always was, uh, a bit of a jokester, um, have a good time, uh, you know, have fun with people, have fun with myself. You know, a lot of the memes I post on Instagram, half if not more are memeing self experiences and and things that you know I've done or I went through uh and and making light of the situation so yeah I agree like there's 
there's a time and a place to be serious and take things serious, but no need whatsoever to take yourself too seriously. For sure. And I feel like when I started this channel and I kind of went to a, a trade show for fitness, you know, I felt very uncomfortable kind of being in the fitness space. And I was almost trying to be more serious than I am naturally. And I think as I've been doing this a little bit longer now, and I'm starting to feel more comfortable, like my natural personality is starting to show a little bit more. I'm joking around more because, you know, uh, my thought is like, hey, I'm the tech guy. I'm not the fitness guy. Everyone's mogging me. I feel uncomfortable. I need to show that I'm like very serious. And then I think it took like a few months probably for me to like slowly break through that and say like, hey, I'm just going to be myself and whatever happens, happens. Right. And, and you know, like most of the, the, the influencers or whatever you want to call the people in the space, like people forget about the human side. Like we're all people, we're all humans. And, you know, most most everybody can relate, uh, you know, to human senses of humor and desires and emotions and even though they may project, you know, a robotic image uh, via their Instagram or whatever social media, at the end of the day, they're also a human too. And, you know, we all laugh and have a good time, uh, you know, in our own time. And, and that sort of camaraderie uh, is there. And mo most of the fitness people I talk to, um, even the ones who do this for a living, our personal and private uh, uh, chats, 99% of it ain't about fitness. <laughs> no, it's just about whatever. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, for sure. And I know like when I went to that uh, first trade show, I was across from the Rascal booth and uh, everyone was dressed like very in Rascal apparel. Everyone was a lot younger than me. And I was like, whoa, this is a lot for me. Like I felt super out of place because I'm like this older guy with the startup who trains for fun and I'm not like fully in the culture. My culture is that um, I'm, I'm an out of the box person and I'm hard to guess what my hobbies are. That's always been me. Like I don't go all in on one thing. I go all in on a bunch of different things and that's what makes me up. And I felt like uh, there was like, Oh, this is kind of weird. Like these people are like super into bodybuilding and dressing this way. And I'm just, you know, here in my polo on the other side. <laughs> cool. Um, all right. I got one more thing for you here. All right. I actually got two more things for you. Here. What would you train if you could train with uh, Arnold and Stallone? Oh, uh, gosh. You know, they. I never really looked up to them a whole, whole lot, to be honest. Like, I like the Rocky movies and, you know, Terminator and stuff, but... Uh, mm -hmm. I would probably do arms with Arnold just because that is my lagging part. And he had some great biceps. Um, and I don't know with Stallone, I guess uh, probably some sort of conditioning or something. I know uh, he trained with Franco Colombo for the Rocky movies. And I would imagine at least some of that rubbed off on him. Uh, so I, maybe, you know, some sort of conditioning circuit training uh, with Sly, but definitely arms with Arnold. Whoops. All right. I'm going to end today with the fun question. A wise man once said, and I quote, Super Nintendo Sega Genesis. When I was dead broke, man, I couldn't picture this. I see that you collect a lot of uh, video games. So what are your, your top three video games of all time? Okay. Shout out to Biggie for the rhymes. Um, <laughs> my favorite game ever is Bubble Bobble for NES. Uh, I love that game. Um, the, the gameplay is extremely fun. The, the two player makes it even more fun. Um, the, the visuals on it are great. The, the music's great. It's really charming. Um, bubble bobble, definitely my favorite game of all time. Um, going beyond that, it's really hard. I've played so many different games. Um, I'm a big gen one Pokemon guy, but only gen one. I do not go beyond gen one. Uh, I think I've got two copies each of red, blue, and yellow. Uh, I've got like three Game Boys. I've got the link cables to trade between them. Uh, so I, I'd, I'd probably go ahead and say uh, the Gen 1 Pokemon, uh, Red, Blue, Yellow, uh, probably make my top three. Then after that, man, that, that's where it gets tough because as, as much as I like my retro games and I have vastly more of those, um, there was a time I was really competitive in Call of Duty Online. Um, okay. Black Ops 1 was 
really fun. And I was unemployed when it came out and getting unemployment checks. So I would play it like nine hours a day, like it was my job. <laughs> uh, but then I think the new Grand Theft Auto Online, uh, Grand Theft Auto 5, and it's been a decade since that came out. But when that first came out and I first started playing it online, uh, to me as a gamer, you know, who was born in 1985 and grew up, you know, through, I can remember Atari, you know, all the way coming up through, you know, Nintendo, Super Nintendo, Sega, the Sega Master System. Um, you know, I had a Virtual Boy, um, Nintendo 64, and coming up through the generations. Uh, Grand Theft Auto Online, like, encompassed, you know, everything what a young me could dream that a video game could encompass. Like, it had everything, you know, obviously the Grand Theft Auto games uh, were masterpieces in and of themselves, and I had that, but you added in the online aspect and, you know, it had, they, they introduced the first person mode in it and you had all these different game modes, all these different shooters. You could collect things. There's a whole racing community uh, based around Grand Theft Auto Online. I'm partial to racing games. I do like uh, cars a lot. So it's hard for me to not put Grand Theft Auto Online in my top three, just because it seemed like when it came out, it was like, the culmination of what I thought an all inclusive, uh, you know, sort of ultimate be all end all video game uh, could be, you know, in my imagination when I was growing up. That's awesome. Uh, here's a, I don't know if you remember in the first gen Pokemon, do you, do you remember missing? No. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Where you had to surf up and down the, the Cinnabar Island glitch. Yeah. The glitch. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I used to always get scared when it came on the screen because I'm like, it's like a virus on my on my screen. Like I used to play on computer, like I had the emulator, and I would play uh, the first gen. And I I remember trying to catch missing no. So that there's actually if if I can't remember exactly, uh, how, it, it's on one of my cartridges too. But if you can manipulate your your name when you name your character, and then when you do that missing no glitch after you've manipulated your name, you can actually. Uh, battle with professor oak and uh professor oak has a team of pokemon uh, of legit pokemon yeah. and it, it, it's rumored that he was allegedly going to be the final boss and that his team is still in the code uh but you know they they made him not end up being the final boss but you can trigger the battle with him yeah. and he's got like higher level 60 and level 70 uh of pokemon that you can battle against that's crazy. And yeah. then you're talking about uh, Sega. So I had a I had a Sega CD and a 32X. If you remember that, I, I do. I do. I never got to play them, but I remember those being a thing. Absolutely. Yeah, the Sega CD was cool because like it was the first system that had like real life intro. So I had like NHL '94 and had like real life hockey intro, and it was just super cool. And then uh, for I don't know if you'd count these as like racing games, but they were car games. We used to play a lot of uh, Twisted Metal and Road Rash. I don't know if you played either of those. I uh, I was more partial to Vigilante 8 than uh, Twisted Metal. Uh, but it is the same thing like Car Arena Combat. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, Road Rash. I had Road Rash for PS1. Uh, fun times. Awesome. That is Freaky D. Thank you for your time today. Uh, I really appreciate it. Where can everyone find you? Uh, so, uh, freaky D on YouTube, um, freaky with an I E underscore D underscore zero five five zero on Instagram. Um, and I would look for me on Instagram. Uh, if, if you're interested in my coaching or anything, shoot me a DM on there and, uh, we can talk and see if we'd be a good fit and be glad to work with you. All right. Thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.